Hi there, I'm Dr. Jesse Miller, a pulmonologist, here to talk about endobronchial valves for lung volume reduction. These are an FDA-approved, well-proven strategy for certain patients with severe COPD. I'm here today to talk to Dr. Sophia Ali, a family practice physician, about some of the most frequently asked questions about endobronchial valves. Good morning, Dr. Ali. How are you today? Thank you, Dr. Miller. I am doing fine. I am delighted to be here this morning talking to you about this treatment and as a primary care provider to learn how it can be used for my patients. Let's start right off the bat with the obvious question, what is endobronchial valve treatment? Endobronchial valves are one-way valves that we place after targeting a specific lobe in the patient's lung. The goal of which is to deflate that unhealthy lobe and allow the good healthy lung to re-expand. Can you tell me a little bit more about how long this treatment has been used and also what evidence there is that supports it? There's been a number of randomized clinical trials looking at endobronchial valves. The LIBERATE trial published in 2018 led to the FDA approval of endobronchial valves for lung volume reduction, and that was the study that showed that patients had improved symptoms of shortness of breath, improved exercise tolerance, and improved lung function as well. Approximately 80% of people will have improvement in one of those categories. That sounds like a really great therapy. Can you tell me what some of the complications and risks of the therapy are so that I can have an informed discussion with my patients about it? In particular, the risks include pneumothorax after placement of the valves. Approximately 30% of patients in clinical trials did have a pneumothorax after the procedure. We typically keep these patients in the hospital for three to five days to monitor for a collapsed lung. In addition, there is risks of COPD exacerbation as well as pneumonia, which we can treat. Who are going to be ideal candidates for this treatment, and who should we be considering in primary care for referral for this? Good question. That's a question I often receive from many referring providers. And in my opinion, I believe the best patients to refer for endobronchial valves are those with significant symptoms despite the maximum amount of therapy. These are symptoms including shortness of breath or dyspnea on exertion. OK, so patients with severe COPD or emphysema are candidates for this procedure if they're on maximum medical therapy and they're still having symptoms. Are there contraindications that I should be aware of or people that I shouldn't be considering for this? Absolutely. Some conditions that may preclude a candidate from having endobronchial valves include non-COPD lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, heart disease or heart failure, lung cancer as well. Also patients with allergy to nickel or titanium. So what are the benefits that patients experience, like the real life practical benefits in their day-to-day -day life after having this procedure? The ideal candidate for endobronchial valves also has certain goals or life activities that they can't achieve because of their symptoms of shortness of breath. These are patients who like to go for walks or fishing with their grandchildren. These are the patients we look for who are the best candidates who can have some improvement in symptoms after placement of endobronchial valves. This sounds like a really great treatment option for our patients, but on a practical note, is it covered? Who's covering it? Endobronchial valves have received an evidence A level from the gold guidelines and are FDA approved. They are widely accepted as a standard of care therapy for severe COPD in the right patient. And most insurance companies, including Medicare, provide reimbursement. OK, got it. So once I'm ready to refer somebody for this procedure, what sorts of tests do you need ahead of time for us to do as primary care providers uh, before we send the patient over? Ultimately, we're looking for patients who have confirmed COPD on office spirometry. And then once they see us in the pulmonary clinic, we can go on to obtain full pulmonary function testing, echocardiogram, arterial blood gas, amongst other testing prior to endobronchial valves. Is there anything else you want us as primary care providers to be telling our patients about it before they get referred to you? That they understand that endobronchial valves are a tool to help with symptoms and not necessarily a cure for their underlying lung disease. Once somebody has a procedure, what sort of follow-up is required on the primary care end in the subsequent weeks and months uh, after the treatment? As the primary pulmonologist, we typically provide follow-up care for most of our patients for endobronchial valves, but do realize that's not always possible in patients who don't live near our office. When following up with a primary care provider, we recommend repeating pulmonary function testing in the future and assessing patients for symptoms. Oftentimes, we find if patients develop symptoms again, they need to be re-referred for further evaluation. 
Thank you so much for explaining that. Is there anything else I should be aware of? As a primary care provider, you know that COPD is not a disease of just older people. We see younger people as well, both men and women. Typically, the best way to refer a patient is to find a pulmonologist in your area who does this procedure or a group that does this procedure and have them evaluated by that individual. Thank you, Dr. Miller. I really appreciate your time and your expertise. It's invaluable for us to learn about this procedure in primary care so that we can help our patients. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for those questions today, and I appreciate your time.